Tyson Fury was recently reflecting on his catastrophic fall from boxing grace, and he explained that it was actually a predictable outcome, almost an inevitability. When you look at the details of his life, it's easy to see what he meant. Tyson Fury is a gypsy. His great-granduncle on his mother's side was a legendary king of the gypsies, Bartley Gorman, a soft-spoken, mild-mannered, tortured legend of the bare-knuckle boxing game, a man who earned his title through a lifetime of blood, sweat, and certainly tears. Listen to him speak. There's a gravity and an anguish to the way he reflects on the details of his life. Heavy is a head that wears a crown, and that is no different for a gypsy king. If you can't take pain, real pain, I mean, you can't be a fighter. It's so violent, I can't explain it to you. The fighting, I mean. When, you get men in, when I get men in front of me, they try to kill me. They try to wipe me off the face of the earth. And the men behind them shouting to them, kill him, kill him, kill him. So, you know what I mean? There ain't no referee going to jump in. Oh, he's got a cut over his eye. Do you know what I mean? Uh, stop it. There's a cut over his eye. There's no stop it. Not if he ripped my heart out. They wouldn't stop it. See, you can't be a fighter if you're afraid of anyone. Forget about it. You've got to be in it to know what it's like. The title King of the Gypsies can be a curse. Once you have it, the only way out of a violent life is to lose it in a bare-knuckle contest. According to many, Bartley Gorman remained undefeated till his death, and as such, he was still fighting young men at almost 50 years of age. I started fighting when I was 10 years old, right up to now, I'm 51. When I say I retired, I'm retired. But there's, but there's no such a word as retired among the gypsies. They, I mean, unless I am on two sticks, walking with a frame, then they'd say, yes, he's retired. If you look reasonable, you're not, you haven't retired. Um, as long as I could be beaten, um, no matter what condition I was in, for them to say that they beat Bartley Gorman, there would be a feather in the cap. It's becoming a burden, a burden on me, Shane, yet this thing's becoming a burden on me. But Bartley isn't the only bare-knuckle king in Tyson's family. Before him, the crown belonged to a man named Uriah Burton. Before me, Uriah Burton, Big Just, was a king of the gypsies. And when he died, I inherited his title. I fought Johnny Fletcher. Then I become the champion of the gypsies, the king of the gypsies. Uriah Burton is also a relative on Fury's father's side. And before he died, he basically foretold the fate of Fury. In Tyson's own words, he said to my uncle, you know, when your brother gets married to my niece, she's going to drive him insane. But a fighting man will come out of those sons he has. He predicted my future a year before I was born. I know it sounds stupid to talk about breeding and classing human beings like animals, but I am fighting royalty. Uriah is on my father's side, and Bartley Gorman, the other undefeated champion, is on my mother's side. I have gypsy kings on both sides of the family. So Tyson clearly regarded the title of Gypsy King as a type of birthright. But even beyond his fighting roots and Uriah's prophecy, his father John, who was also a boxer, named his son after the scariest motherfucker to ever cast a shadow over the sport of boxing. Fury was born three months premature, weighing just one pound. The outlook was grim. If he was ever to even see a first birthday, he was gonna have to be a fighter. Appropriately, John Fury gave his son a fighter's name, and the result is the greatest name in combat sports history. Tyson Fury. It just does not get any better. I mean, what were the odds this guy's family name would be fucking Fury? It is boxing poetry. But at the time when I was boxing, Mike Tyson, he was the dogs of boxing, the Tom Perriot. Young guy, 20, 21, smashing everybody in smithereens. You know, used to get up every morning, three, four o'clock, with me coffee, never missed a fight. And, and luckily for me, Tyson was to be born when Tyson, when Mike Tyson was at his best. Yeah. So I thought, you know what? 
he struggled to get into the world, Tyson. We didn't think he was going to make it. As a baby, we got told that. And I thought, if he makes it, he's worthy of a good name. And what name can I call him? I didn't have to think too hard. Oh, his name's going to be Tyson after the greatest heavyweight at, My at, at, at that, that time. time. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah he, was the, he was the best ever, you know. Yeah. I, I like Mike Tyson. I know he's had a raw deal. He was badly guided. You know, he was badly handled. He was missed. He was abused, really. I don't know, I'm not watching any fighters. This one guy, Tyson Fury, I like to watch him because he has my name and stuff. So, the fact that somebody would name their son after me and all the stuff that I've been through and all that ugly, nasty, um, yeah, I like him. I like Tyson Fury. <laughs> so presumably, these are all things that would have been lodged in Tyson's mind as a child. His father a boxer, the proud reputation of two gypsy kings looming large over his family. His namesake, the most feared fighter of all fucking time, and part of a fighting breed of people. Listen to Bartley Gorman describe how it was exactly these types of childhood forces that pushed him down the often lonely, often painful road of a gypsy king. Some of the forces that made Fury the man he is have been in motion for generations. My great-grandfather, Bartley Gorman I, was born in 1836. Bartley Gorman II was my grandfather. Then his son, Bartley Gorman III, was a champion of North and South Wales, Gypsy. And um, Bartley Gorman IV, he didn't fight, he was a great lover. Um, Bartley Gorman V, that's me. I'm the champion of the world. It's mine over matter, this is, you see. They just said to me, or my breed. Oh, he's just like his grandfather. A little lad grown up, a little kid, you know. It was just like his grandfather. Look at his red hair. He's another Bartley Gorn. He'll be, he'll be king of the gypsies, champion of them all. No one will beat him. Do you know what I mean? It's totally in my mind. For last night I did sleep in a goose feather bed. With me lord at the side of me. But tonight I will lie in this cold open tent Along with the raggles of his lady home Yes, tonight I will lie in this cold open field Along with the raggles of his lady home Dedication to Bartley Gorman, R.I.P. Legend. Great fighting man, Bartley Gorman. King of the Gypsies, wasn't he? Yeah. There's and there's his daughter behind you. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm not saying I've outlined a recipe for a heavyweight champion, but it's hardly surprising that it created the psychological drivers for Fury to go on to realize what he regarded as his birthright. <laughs> Follow in the footsteps of his namesake and fulfill the prophecy of his grand uncle. It's no surprise that Tyson Fury didn't rest until he had dethroned the most dominant heavyweight of the last 15 years. In 2015, Tyson Fury realized all of the implicit expectations woven into his identity. He was both Gypsy King and the heavyweight champion of the world. Tyson had worked his entire life towards that moment, but when he reached it, it left a vacuum in his life. I believe when you've got a goal in mind all, from being a child all your life, and you do that, then it, I was like, I was lost. I was almost like I didn't have anything more to do in my life. I saw a great video recently on a channel, Academy of Ideas, discussing goals, how underachieving in life can gradually crush a person's spirit. 
ultimately leading to a life of suffering. The risk for depression arises when we stake too much on the achievement of any single goal, especially if the goal is of a grandiose nature. For while some achieve their grandiose goals, most people do not. And as the years pass and the goal remains nothing but a fantasy, the realization eventually sets in that it is unlikely that success will ever be achieved. When the ambitious man whose slogan is either Caesar or nothing does not get to be Caesar, wrote Kierkegaard, he despairs over it. But this also means something else. Precisely because he did not get to be Caesar, he now cannot bear to be himself. Great point, great video. And you see it often. I mean, it's not uncommon. But there is another side to over-investing in a single aspiration. If you set a monumental goal for yourself, orientate your life around it, and eventually achieve it, that can also be incredibly deflating. If that goal becomes the sole purpose of your life, your primary source of meaning, then when you finally achieve it, I mean, yeah, that's great. You set out to do something and you did it. Now what? You just set another goal? That's not always easy. As I've mentioned, for Fury, his goal was set in childhood. It was part of his identity. Moving on from something like that, that can be tough. Even beyond everything I've already discussed in terms of his background, his father described how, as a child, Tyson was obsessed with figures like Muhammad Ali and movies like Rocky. Tyson's life was dedicated to emulating his heroes, dethrone a seemingly unbeatable Russian super champ, and raise a bell. That was his reason for being on his planet. Although I could have carried on and defended the belts and whatever, I wasn't really interested in doing that. I'd beat the man I'd always wanted to do. Because when I was an amateur boxer, I used to watch Vladimir Klitschko on TV as a world heavyweight champion. And I always aimed, he was my target to beat and when I finally beat him it was like climbing me Everest I didn't have anything more to prove and the fire was dead there was no fire I was forcing myself to fight I mean Tyson was already struggling with feelings of meaninglessness here's an interview from six weeks before the Klitschko fight he's open and thoughtful but obviously living in his head he touches on some of life's bigger questions with which he's clearly struggling there's nothing there isn't nothing after boxing for me there's nothing during boxing for me, there's nothing. What do you mean nothing? There is, it's just emptiness, isn't it? Look, what does a belt mean? What does a championship mean? Right, we just went over all this this morning again, me and my dad. I've won already seven, seven titles, belts, whatever. Number one in Britain, Europe, Commonwealth, whatever. Number one in the world, mandatory. What does it all mean? It means nothing. All right, I might, I'm, after this fight, I'll be very, uh, very well, well to do. But what does it all mean? Because we can only, I'll still be dressed like this, a tramp, with a pair of trainers on and a tracksuit. And I'm still going to jump in that car outside and go to whatever I'm going to do. So it doesn't really mean anything. And as to be remembered as a fighter, fuck remembering fighters. It's about activity, it's about now. Remembering fighters is, people can sit here and remember them. And they're just memories, aren't they? It's about doing it now, living that dream today. And all the people who've been champions and, and done their best in their career from the past, they have lived that time today. But now, they're only has-beens. I know that sounds a bad way, word to say, has-beens, but they only are. Look at all the great champions from the past. They're only has-beens, aren't they? And I think all, all great sportsmen from the past envy current people. So again, the answer to that question, what keeps me going, what drives me, what am I aiming for? I ain't aiming to be a great champion. I ain't aiming to be a millionaire. I ain't aiming to be remembered. I ain't aiming for nothing. I'm just living day by day, taking it one day at a time, really. I'm living to die, basically. I'm aiming for the coffin, where we're all going, buried. I'm aiming to be put in, I don't know, aiming for the coffin, yeah, that's it. So we're all gonna die sooner or later, so it's what you do while we're here. I'm, I'm doing boxing, you're doing interviewing, Peter's a trainer. You know, it's, it's what it is. Everyone's got their own job in life, haven't they? And I'm doing my job, that's it. I'm living day to day, eating, surviving, that's it. Look forward to the weekend, going home, seeing the wife and kids, and then I can't wait to get back into training camp. So my whole life should be a training camp, really. Because when I'm out of it, I'm depressed. I don't feel good, I feel like shit. So it is what it is. Nothing drives me, nothing. I ain't interested in titles, I ain't interested in money, I ain't interested in business, I ain't interested in property. It's really drive me, being stress free. Being able to just do what I want, like and not be bothered about jumping in a flash car or going to a flash restaurant or what people think of me or high society people. Not interested in it. 
I know that sounds daft because why would I be boxing? Why am I here today? But I, I really, I've been saying it for a long time. I just really ain't interested. I go in there and, and it's something that I love to do. I love to fight. I love, I love being involved in the gym. I love training and that while I'm doing it. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. And at the end of the day, I'll be another bear bum in the shower after it's all finished. And there'll be somebody else, another 50 million people coming through in the world. And you're just a memory at the end of the day. Despite the clear melancholy, that is a brilliant clip. Because that place, the headspace Fury's in here, that can be a lonely fucking place. Dealing with feelings of futility, meaninglessness, grappling with mortality. If you've ever been there, which I'm assuming most of you have, then there really was tremendous solidarity in listening to the man speak. It is a lonely place, but the implication of Fury's words was that you're not the only one there. These are universal themes. Most people have to face them in their lives. Here's a man in the prime of his youth, on the cusp of achieving a childhood dream, and about to become a multi-millionaire in the process. But even someone like that can struggle to find meaning in it all. Normally, guys in that position, they almost embody a life full of purpose. That's why they can be so inspiring. But here, Fury perfectly articulates an existential crisis most people have to grapple with. And as I've said, there was tremendous solidarity in that. These were the interviews that made me a Fury fan in the first place. And when I previously said I don't miss a Tyson interview, it was mainly for that reason. In a word, solidarity. It'll all be worth it though when we die, because if there's another place after this, it must be better than this shit. And if there's not, well, it was all a big con. What a shit. Anyway, as he said, if he's not in training camp, he feels like shit. So take that type of person already in the midst of a deepening existential crisis and remove the sole purpose from his life. Then the subsequent downward spiral, it is understandable. And as you can see, it was nothing he didn't expect himself. He said to me before the Klitschko fight, he said, what will you do after you win? I said, probably be depressed for a long time. I was almost expecting it. Fury's downfall was brutal. Tyson comes from a different culture, with some different values, and he was about to learn the harsh lesson of what happens when those values clash with a relentless, rabid, totally humorless, left-leaning press on the hunt for tabloid fodder. I can't take Tyson's side entirely. He did make some poorly worded statements about subjects that are best avoided. But in doing so, he became a target. It got to the point where it almost seemed if it was up to them, they'd have printed their scathing headlines in Fury's blood. Rather than being embraced as a national hero, within a month of his victory, Tyson was already on the defensive. At the weekend, Tyson added fuel to the fire in an online interview by saying this. I stand up for me beliefs. My wife's there. Her, her job's cooking and cleaning, looking after these kids, that's it. No other. And she does get to make some decisions, what she's going to cook me for tea in a bit when I get home. Yeah, so his wife's job is cooking and cleaning. I do cook and clean, he does earn the bread, I don't work, but we're definitely not that far back as he's trying to make us. <laughs> yeah, he's, he likes to hear himself speak. I think all women take a little back seat sometimes, but trust me, it may be a man's will, but a woman has a lot to say about it, and they're behind every good man's a good woman. The criticism is about the comments afterwards, for example, saying Jessica Ennis Hill slaps up good, looks good in a dress, and a woman's yeah. best place is in the kitchen and on her back. Well, yeah, I did say that. So, and uh, can you just rephrase the first statement you made? Jessica Ennis slaps up good. Do you really know what that means? It means she looks good when she's got makeup on. Yeah. That's, that was my uh, opinion on that. Oh, no, I know that, yeah. Yeah, and I do think she looks good in a dress. I believe all women look good in dresses. I'll say that again, I'll, I'll re-say re, uh, that again. Um, I think all women do look good in dresses, and is that a crime if I think a woman looks good in a dress? I think, I don't know, I think the objection is maybe that, that the comment is on how Jessica looks rather than on her achievements. But for some reason there was a vendetta against him for a long time to print everything bad that ever got said or done. I mean, they printed, they made this big issue about when he said something about the girl looked nice in a dress. 
I didn't see the big problem with him saying that. He said she was a great runner, she'd done well, she's won achievements, and she looks good in a dress. He made a little joke on the end, the woman does look good in a dress. What's the problem? And it's a terrible thing when you've got to watch someone you know is a kind-hearted, nice person shredded in the media for the full world to then say he's an asshole. He's a jackass, he's a horrible person, him. It's after the watershed, you cannot be a dickhead and win sports personality of the year. Thank you, Clive. That is now, exactly the what the view now, I was struggling <laughs> towards. Exactly. Now that he's come through it all, he downplays the role of the media in his slide. But at the time, he felt utterly rejected by the British public. Even my own country where I was born and raised hate me. The only thing the press wants to write is negativity. As soon as I won the title, I got back off the boat and picked up the newspaper. Tyson done something controversial. It wasn't he's dethroned the best man who's been in a long time. It was that he's done this and he's done that. Anything to try and take credit away from me. When Tyson first come back from his Klitschko fight, instead of getting praise, he got punishment. Straight away. Off the media. Everyone hated him. They, they took, they made a big issue out of things that were said. And they turned it into a public hatred for Tyson. So there was no love there, and I mean, that kind of helped. Obviously, you've done something. If you go out there and you achieve something brilliant, you want a pat on the back. I mean, you don't say you want it, but it's nice to have a clarification that you done well. Like, if I ran out there and run a race and won, and no one said, well done, I'd be devastated. I wouldn't want to race the race again. I'd think, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I'd definitely lose the race, so there's no hope for that happening. So even before his catastrophic slide began, the media were already kicking him around like a dog and using his inclusion on the BBC Sports Personality of the Year as a club to bash him over the fucking head with. And from there, it all spiraled. Within three months of his win, Tyson was already considering retirement. I'm struggling to get motivated. I could walk away. One month later, when the rematch was announced, the public got to see just how unmotivated Fury really was when he showed up to the press conference looking totally out of shape. His weight had ballooned and his head was no longer in the game. He simply did not give a fuck. I don't even live an athlete's lifestyle. It, it's an absolute disgrace to call me an athlete. You couldn't call me an athlete. Absolutely not. I'm, you know, I'll have to show you what the athlete looks like. <laughs> this is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. There you go. Does that look like a fighter's body? Clearly not. Do I give a fuck? No. Have a look. Fat man. That's who beat you. Shame on you, my friend. Shame on me. To be fair, Fury was in a hole, but he just kept digging. Another scandalous video emerged, the press descended like vultures, and Tyson continued to unravel in a reckless fucking fashion. And so when it came time to promote the fight, Tyson was more despondent than ever. In his face-to-face -face with Klitschko, his pain was absolutely palpable. Just look at his face. What ex there's no excuses on my behalf. I can do my best and that's it. Win, lose or draw, I put, I put up my best fight. And if Vladimir beats me, then good luck to him. I'll shake his hand and say he's a better man. And obviously, if I beat him, then I'm still in the same position. Still as sick as ever. Still as depressed as life can be. And still don't really care if I die in any second of the moment. That's the way I live my life. And you can, my wife's there to verify. Is that correct or not? No, is it correct that I live like that or not? See. So, she don't know what I'm going to do. And I live with her. No one knows. My own father don't know what I'm going to do. So, it is what it is. And Fury now confirmed in hindsight the deflating nature of a victory that had for years been virtually the purpose of his life. And you'll feel a difference. Can I ask a question? Did you? I won't feel any different now, will I? I don't feel any different now. I don't feel I know, like... I know. It doesn't really do anything know. to me, you, you know. Know. Win, lose or draw, it I doesn't know. matter. I know you don't care, but... Did you underestimate him first time round? An ankle injury caused the rematch to be rescheduled for October. But before it could take place, he tested positive for blow. The rematch with Klitschko was off for the second and final time.
the British boxing authorities stripped him of his license. And finally, the charade had become too transparent to even continue. Tyson was out of control. He simply wasn't capable of defending his titles. And so, he reluctantly relinquished his remaining belts. And just like that, everything Tyson had spent his whole life building was torn down and destroyed. In less than 12 months, he had gone from world champion to a kind of a cautionary tale, a symbol of wasted talent, tabloid fodder to be mocked, while analysts like Max Kellerman speculated about a weak mind. But Tyson Fury actually did it. He won the heavyweight title. And now the thought that he's accomplished that, of having to defend it, I believe his personality is collapsing under that pressure. That's my read of this situation. The boxing world, it quickly moved on without him. You're playing a part, playing part, but there's no time. And this was not even rock bottom, not even close. Things would get a lot worse before they got better for Fury. And over time, it would appear less and less likely we'd ever see him box again. But he was from an early stage at least aware of the nature and scale of the task that lay ahead, or what he would later call the hardest fight of his life. When he relinquished the belts, it was with the following statement. I won the titles in the ring and I believe they should be lost in the ring. But I'm unable to defend at this time, and I have taken the hard and emotional decision to now officially vacate my treasured world titles and wish the next in-line contenders all the very best as I now enter another big challenge in my life, which I know, like against Klitschko, I will conquer. Trying to talk to me Where is my mind?